Linus Pauling and vitamin C. Uh, so I was asked about this, and phew, wow, what a topic. Um, I feel like no matter how I answer this, uh, it's going to bother half the people. Um, but I'm going to give you guys the most honest answers I can uh, with the best knowledge that I can provide. So, um, like, don't you hate it when people say it depends? <laughs> Linus Pauling is extremely interesting. His work was fantastic. Uh, it really, I don't want to say it revolutionized, but it, it brought up a lot of things that people had not carefully examined. And it provided a lot of new ideas and a lot of research that we still look at today even the parts of it that are incorrect. So this is something that's very important. I want people to understand this. Um, think about time. Just like the technology we have today versus the technology that they had in the past, right? Uh, I've discussed this before. We used to believe that the uh, brain did not develop new neurons in adulthood, and now we know that it does. But you have to consider this. They were correct when they said it because they were basing it on the evidence that they had. So the evidence that they had at that time was limited by the quality of the imaging of the brain. As technology improved, we can get these images with higher and higher resolution. You can see smaller and smaller parts of the brain, and suddenly, oh, you do develop new neurons. Right, but they were too small to see them at the time that we made the conclusion that you're not developing new neurons, right? Does that make sense? So, like, yes, it's incorrect, but the people that said it at the time um, they had no way of knowing that they were incorrect because with the best of the technology that they had at that time, they couldn't see this change. They couldn't measure this change. Because of technology, we're now able to measure that change. And so now we know that what we thought in the past was incorrect. So that being said, um, Linus Pauling, right, the whole vitamin C thing, uh, I would say that the first thing to consider is that... Um, Vitamin C certainly does have many of the effects that Pauling suggested that it has. We, we can see that it, it, it definitely does a variety of things. And um, we even have some good data suggesting that high doses of vitamin C actually, uh, instead of being antioxidant, they're pro-oxidant, which then provides us this uh, possibility. I don't ever want to say that it, it will work. Nothing ever works in cancer, but um, there's a possibility that really high doses of vitamin C could have a pro-oxidant effect which would kill cancer cells. That's entirely possible uh, from a mechanistic standpoint. Um, if you even understand how like radiation works or chemotherapy, it actually creates oxidative stress, which is what kills the cancer cells. So it has a pro-oxidant effect. That's how these things work. It's not like you provide a bunch of antioxidants and the cancer goes away. No, like the way you kill the cell is through these pro-oxidants. Um, so if you think about it from that perspective, uh, you know, vitamin C, had very high doses, has the potential to kill a cancer cell the same way that radiation or chemotherapy would work by creating this excessive level of oxidation, this excessive oxidative stress, and that will kill the cells. Um, this all turns into that whole reactive oxygen species thing. I don't think you guys follow my channel because you want to listen to physiology lectures, but if you do... Um, I'm more than happy to teach them. I can dig out a whole bunch of biology textbooks and all kinds of stuff for you guys and go through this stuff. I don't really think other people care about the, like, the nitty-gritty details as much as... Like, it's like if I sat down and told you all about the electron transport chain. Like, is that really going to change how you eat? Is there anything actionable in that? Like, if I go through the, all the steps of the Krebs cycle, a.k.a. citric acid cycle, like, it's not going to change things for you. Uh, Cori cycle... Like, you're not going to suddenly be like, oh, Cori cycle, I should add more carbohydrates. Like, it's just, so I'm not going to waste your time with that. What I will tell you is that uh, vitamin C definitely appears to have a variety of significant benefits in everything from viruses, because uh, it actually inhibits their ability to replicate, uh, to heart disease, cancer, infections, etc., uh, there have been studies where giving people high doses of vitamin C helped them to recover from bacterial infections, uh, reduced the rate of infections after surgeries. So, like, there's definitely something to be said about that. As far as things like dosage, um, I 
feel like that's one of the areas that's really cloudy. And I will base that off of a f research besides polling. Um, I am not entirely convinced that high doses of vitamin C are necessary or even um, efficacious, or whatever you want to call it, uh, to get the benefits of vitamin C. So I believe that most of the literature that I've seen, uh, Pauling was recommending like something like 2 grams of vitamin C a day, and I think they recommended a minimum of 400 milligrams a day. So minimum you need to get at least 400, and if I remember correctly, just looking through the things, in sometime in the 1970s, Pauling's, uh, the, the Pauling Institute or whatever released a recommendation that um, 2 grams a day would be the optimal dose. Mm, I'm not sure that you need that much. In fact, actually, I feel like it's going to have like a weird curve to it. Where, like, if you wanted to treat cancer, you'd probably need, like, 10 grams, 15 grams. Like, and it's going to have to be IV um, in order for you to get it, because you just can't absorb it orally. Like, not at that dosage. I similarly don't think that 2 grams is going to have that much of a difference compared to, like, say, 500 milligrams, because of the fact that there's a limit to your absorption. Like, it's a, it's a water-soluble thing, and um, if you take really high doses of it, you pee it out. So... You're kind of limited by your ability to absorb things. Um, it's kind of like taking huge doses of B12. Uh, it's probably beneficial for you if you're B12 deficient, but if you're not B12 deficient, like B2, B12, stuff like that, you just end up with really yellow urine. It's like bright yellow, neon yellow, highlighter yellow. Um, and that's because you know a lot of it just isn't getting absorbed. If you don't need it, your body's like, mm, guess we'll just excrete it. That's not harmful. I'm not. Uh, I'm not going to sit here and tell you. Oh my God! If you took a gram of vitamin C, it's harmful to you. No, no, not at all. You take three grams of vitamin C. It's not harmful. Um, the exception being people that have kidney stones. So that should always be in there. Um, not that any of this is medical advice. This is not medical advice. This is just me telling you what the literature says. So really high doses of vitamin C can actually cause people to develop kidney stones. Um, just something to be aware of. If you're someone who suffers from kidney stones, then maybe you might want to watch your vitamin C intake a little bit, but it generally doesn't happen with getting vitamin C from, from food. People just simply don't eat enough. Like, I mean, I suppose you could. Like, if you were really, like, I'm determined to overdose on vitamin C, I'm going to eat nothing but lemons today and every day thereafter. Um, yeah, maybe you could. Maybe you could. But um, for, like, most of us, <laughs> we, we don't sit down and eat pounds of citrus fruit a day um, so I don't think that that's a risk as far as getting it from your food in supplementation you know taking it as a supplement yes you could get into really high doses but um, I'm going to circle back around to the point that I made about how I don't think that you need two grams to get the benefits I feel like uh, when you look at the different research reviews and meta-analyses so that's what I'm looking at I'm not looking at a single study single studies are well you know what I think of single studies. You can find a single study that says anything. You need to look at the full body of all the literature and uh, look at the research reviews, look at ML analyses, you know, and, and, and see what the general outcome is. of. Like, if there are 100 studies, you need to look at all 100 studies and figure out what the majority of them say. The majority of them will agree with, you know, some, some similar outcome. Um, so looking at vitamin C and particularly, um, you know, the supplemental forms, um, 500 milligrams a day seems to be enough. It, it, like if you just look through the different studies, will it, uh, impair your hypertrophy? Well, that's a good question. Uh, for young people, it does. It appears to actually reduce your adaptation to training. Uh, for older people though, it, even things like ibuprofen seems to actually lead to strength increases for them. Uh, I'm going to assume it's because young people have better redox, better redox potential, um, so they're able to recover on their own. They don't need anything extra. Uh, older people, as we get over the age of 65, you know, maybe your body isn't so awesome at repairing itself. So taking some extra vitamin C might help your body to repair, recover from things. Uh, similar to the same reason why NSAIDs can help the older population, but definitely inhibit the muscle growth and strength gains in younger populations. 
That's a tangential thing, but it's kind of related to vitamin C because vitamin C at lower doses is an antioxidant. Basically, what I'm trying to express here is what I said in the beginning, that it, it depends. Um, I do not think that you need the high doses that Pauling recommended. Just looking at the more recent literature, and this isn't a criticism of Pauling, this isn't a criticism of the Pauling Institute, it's just looking at the research that we have available now, it doesn't seem that the dosage needs to be extremely high. It seems like you get the majority of the benefits at 400 to 500 milligrams, and that seems to be sufficient. Cancer is a weird topic. Um, I don't know what to say about cancer. That's one of those weird topics. I could do probably like a 10 hour long, 12 hour long series on discussing cancer treatments and whether are they efficacious, do they work, what does and doesn't work. Um, and my takeaway from having actually done research in this and you know, spent time in labs and my time in academia, um, nothing works. It's like the most depressing thing. Like I don't recommend you go into cancer research. Um, you probably, if you are at that stage in your life where you're trying to decide what to do, you probably want to go into cancer research because you envision yourself doing something great. I know I did. I thought, I'm going to cure cancer. I'm going to find a cure. And then, uh, then you get into the research, and it's just like every, every, everything dies. Um, especially like when you start getting out of, it's really easy to cure cancer in mice. I've cured cancer more times than you can count. Like in a petri dish, like in vitro studies, everything works. I am so amazing. I have killed cancer. I've cured cancer more times than I, I don't even, can't even tell you in a petri dish. Mouse models. Uh, now try to do it in a canine model. That's fucked up. You ever work in a lab where the, the dogs die? That's fucked up. Um, we don't give the dogs cancer. They get them from shelters. They already have cancer. So just so you don't think that there's some weird creepy experiment going on where we're giving dogs cancer. These dogs end up in shelters um, and they have cancer, and um, they're going to die. So you try to treat them as best as you can, and, and they still die anyways. Um, and it's really unbelievably depressing. It's like, it's harsh. You don't want to go into that kind of work. Don't do it. Like A part of you will die with it. Um, similarly, dealing with humans, um, you know, maybe you're working in a lab and you're doing research on, you know, the the role of corticosteroids and glucocorticoids in the treatment of things like oligodendroglioma. And so, um, you know, all you're doing is you're not treating these people. These people are working with an oncologist. They're working with medical doctors. But, you know, maybe you have them come in for your study and get a brain scan. And uh, you go to call them, you know, three or four months later to follow up. And, um, yeah. So they, they don't make it either, and that's another weird one because they're really nice people and they're good people because most people are good people. Um, and, yeah, anytime you go to follow up with people after these things, um, they're either doing worse or they're uh, no longer available. Um, so don't go into cancer research. But vitamin C in cancer, um, you know, there's a possibility that in certain cancers, certain cancers, uh, let's be really specific here, that um, every cancer is different. So, like, your cancer may or may not respond to some treatment. It doesn't, you can't universally say anything. So vitamin C might be efficacious in a certain cancer, uh, just as maybe, like, carboplatin is efficacious in a certain cancer, and uh, doxorubicin is efficacious in another cancer, okay? People want to tell you shit all the time about cures for cancer. They don't, they're not out there. No one's hiding them. I, I assure you, no one's hiding the cure for cancer. People think that, oh, they're hiding the cure for cancer. No, they aren't. If you cured cancer, you would be like, you, you'd be the richest man in the world. That's a big incentive. No one's hiding the cure. Think about it. Steve Jobs couldn't afford the cure. They have a cure for cancer and Steve Jobs couldn't, couldn't afford it. 
right? So um, here's the deal. Like, maybe for some specific application, vitamin C could be beneficial, but that doesn't mean that it works for every cancer. So I would say that you should be very, very skeptical of the claims that vitamin C will cure cancer if that is what people are looking at when they're looking at the polling stuff. Um, I just want to be really clear that like, I don't think that that's going to work. Um, same thing for ketogenic diets. Ketogenic diets do not work. They do not work. I know lots of people are like, oh yeah, ketogenic diets will cure cancer. It's like, no, you don't understand how cancer functions. Like, yes, daughter cells die. Oh, okay. What about the stem cells? Oh, well, they run on oxidative phosphorylation. So like, go ahead and restrict carbs all you want. They're not running on anaerobic glycolysis, so I don't know why people think that this will work the way they think it will work. Just, oh, because it worked in rats. Oh, yeah, it worked in a Maureen study with a cell line that doesn't even exist in humans. It may slow it down. That's something important. It may slow it down. Uh, so I don't want to just, I'm not shitting on ketogenic diets. Not for one second likely a ketogenic diet will slow down the rate that it is growing. A lot of that has to do with the fact that it's um, insulin. So eating carbohydrates causes insulin release. Insulin is really good at making things grow. So a ketogenic diet will slow down the rate that the cancer is growing, but I don't believe that ketogenic diets will cure cancer by itself. You probably have to, you know, still do chemotherapy or radiation, or surgical excision, etc. That's not to say that keto doesn't have a benefit, okay? It, it certainly could, but it will slow it down. It won't cure. There's a big there's a big difference between making your cancer grow faster or slowing it down versus killing it. Killing it is really hard. Slowing it down isn't so hard. So that's neither here nor there. Uh, point is, a lot of people ask about Linus Pauling and the vitamin C stuff. I don't think it, I think it's overblown in cases like cancer. I think it is very efficacious in things like infections, viruses, um, you know, colds, flus, etc., whatever. It's definitely got efficacy in those situations. Um, there's some evidence suggesting that it's beneficial for heart health. And I, like I said, I think 400, 500 milligrams appears to be, this is what's in the research, this is what's in the literature, this is my opinion. 400 to 500 milligrams seems to be enough that people are getting the benefits of it. Um, I do not think that you need the super high doses to get the benefits because when they look at the research and they give people the super high doses, they have the same outcome as the people that were taking 500 milligrams. So that's my take on this. Um, that's I know it's a shitty answer, right? Because you want me to tell you it's either all wrong or it's all right or no. It's, it's something that you should look at but maybe think about the fact that, you know, does vitamin C work for this thing? Yes. But do you need that dosage? No. That's a better way of thinking of it. Like, you don't need these super high doses, but look at all the other literature on vitamin C. It's one of the most researched things out there. There's tons of literature on vitamin C, and there's a very good reason why you want vitamin C. Um, so I'm not, like, telling you, like, don't don't take in any vitamin C at all. No, like vitamin C is good for you. Um, but I just don't think that you need these super high doses. The exception might be cancer, in which case you're not going to get that orally. You're not going to buy a bottle of vitamin C pills and take them and get dosages of 20 grams in a day. You're going to have to get IV for that. And that's something that has to be decided by a medical provider. That's something you need to talk to your doctor about because, um, you know, it's one of those things where like, if you're going to put this pro-oxidant into your system, I mean, this is going to have a chemo-like effect. It's going to kill more than just cancer cells. And, of course, you're at risk for kidney stones and stuff like that, too. So, something to consider. Um, yeah. I hope I answered this question well. Uh, I apologize if there's something more about it that people wanted to know. Um, I assume that most people are interested in it because of cancer, um, but maybe that assumption is incorrect. Um, if there's something more specific about vitamin C, by, feel free to comment below and ask. Um, and I will certainly tell you, like, oh, what's its role in recovering from exercise? Like, that's an easy one. Um, that stuff like that is super easy to cover. We can talk all about how antioxidants may be good or bad in different situations. Um, you know, I think vitamin C is a great thing to use in season, uh, like, because you want to recover between games. Um, we're not focused on hypertrophy between games. We're 
you know, focused on recovering for the next game. So that's a different situation entirely. Antioxidants are awesome in season. Off season, probably don't want them because you want as much stress on the system as you can adapt to. Anyways, if you guys like this, like the video. Uh, apparently, YouTube penalizes me if you guys watch my video and don't like it. I think that's a weird thing. Uh, but whatever. <laughs> if you guys don't like the video, then don't like it. Give it a thumbs down and comment below and tell me why you didn't like it. Um, that way I can make better videos in the future. Yeah, actually, if you guys give me feedback and tell me what you don't like, I will make a point to change something in the future. And if you guys like this kind of content, you're interested in these types of topics, uh, be sure to subscribe. And like I said, if you comment below and you ask for something, I will do my best to answer it. Uh, so thank you so much for your time, and I hope this helps you.